So have you uh, found a new Netflix show since we've started this series to start watching every single moment of your life? That's not the point of the sermon series, by the way. The sermon series is Genesis, a binge-worthy Bible series, and our point is not that you become addicted to a new show. It's not at all what we're trying to do, but we're trying to highlight the scriptures as they're written for us. You see, there is some commonality between entertainment today and the Bible that both the Bible and entertainment today in movies and in television shows present us with a flawed world. They all have moments in them of, of people experiencing difficult situations, of people dealing with the effects of sin in this world, of people who are in need of hope to come to them in difficult situations. But what we find in the Bible is a place that the Bible goes that these other points of entertainment in our culture can't. And that is through the power of the Holy Spirit, our immersion in the Bible actually leads us closer to God and his unending love for us as his people through his son Jesus Christ whom he has sent for us. And so we're uplifting scripture, but also realizing that there are some touch points in society, especially on Netflix and on television, that we can use to jump into what scripture has for us. For the majority of my life, I had considered television shows and movies to simply be entertainment, solely entertainment, allowing us to disengage from life for a while, and then after, say, an hour and a half or however long the movie or the show went, after the credits rolled, we could get back into whatever reality we were living in. Basically, it was an interruption of our daily life and then back into our life again. But I've started to realize over the last several years that's not entirely true. That there are some television shows and some movies that present us with some of life's biggest questions that at one point or another in our lives, we need to explore and confront ourselves. Take, for instance, the television show, uh, the television series, Lost. It's on Netflix now, all six seasons, 121 episodes in total for an hour each. When you look at it that way, you realize how much time you spent in front of a television, right? But in Lost... It follows this group of people who are on a plane, Oceanic Flight 815, if you haven't seen it, that are traveling from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles, California, and on the way, the plane crashes onto an island. And so as this show unfolds, after many seasons and episodes, we find and we watch how the different survivors of this plane crash must work together. But then there's an underlying point, an underlying story that takes place, and we actually look at every single individual character throughout the show and how they experience not only the heightened joys, but also the deep lows of confronting some of life's biggest questions. Like, what is my purpose here? Or or will I confront and deal with personal trauma or devastation in my life in ways that are healthy? Those questions and many more are explored through this television show. Early on in season one, I think it's the fifth episode or so, there's a moment between main characters Jack Shepard and John Locke. And Jack Shepard goes out to be by himself on this island after the plane has crashed because he's dealing with some things himself. He thinks that as a doctor and a leader in the show, he thinks that he's having hallucinations that have resulted from the plane crash, that they are direct, a direct health issue from the plane crash. But John, in a conversation with Jack, pushes him to a new possibility. Go ahead and have a look. I'm going to remind you it is six seasons and 121 total episodes. So if you want to see how that story goes, you'll be in it for a while. You see, Jack, he's having hallucinations of his father with whom he has a tumultuous relationship. And what we find in the show Lost is not only are these people lost on an island, but in many ways they are lost in their lives, needing direction, needing focus somehow, any way. And as this show unfolds, we find Jack continuing to explore the question for himself that's, that's offered to him by John. Why are you out here, Jack? That's the question. And exploring this question, we see Jack continually in attention. That as a doctor and a leader on the island, he is called to give care and also lead people who could very much care less about him, who don't want to be led by him at different situations, and yet he's the one called on to lead them. That is a tough place for him to be, and we see that unfold and expose throughout the show. 
this tension that Jack finds himself in. And you know, it's interesting because Genesis chapter 6 exposes for us one of the rare glimpses into the heart of God. The tension that he feels himself as a God who is just and a God who is merciful. A God who is one of fair justice and one who is very grace-filled. We find this tension playing out in Genesis chapter 6 as God surveys the creation that he made just a few chapters earlier and he sees that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is not at all how God orchestrated life to be. And this is not at all what he sees. This is not at all how God created humanity to operate amongst one another. And yet that's what he sees. This completely disheveled society. In fact, the thrust of God's instructions to Noah to start building an ark before it even starts raining takes place in these words by God after he looks upon his creation. He says, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them, God says. And from this point on, it's only a matter of time before the rains came down and the floods came up and, and terror was played out among every single individual who was not on that ark. Now, it's not uncommon in our society today to point to a situation like this in the Bible, this, this moment of tragedy and terror taking place, and a question asked of God's action. How can a good God allow such tragedy to take place to all the men, women, and children who are not on the ark? That's not an uncommon question to ask. In fact, those who are cynical against God's word, trying to figure it out, might ask that question. Maybe, maybe you've had that question pass by your mind or, or through your heart at one point or another, and that's okay. But you see, if we are going to go that route of blaming God, we also need to ask an equally valid and important question from the other side that hits a whole lot closer to home for us. And that question is this, why do people feel they can do whatever they want, ourselves included, without any consequences? You see, because that question causes us to look in the mirror a little bit more intently. And we may not always like what we see. But truth be told, it's a moment of faithful honesty that we are called to have as the people of God. It's a moment that, that, that we might actually start to realize that blaming God for his actions is actually our hollow way of trying to cover up our own actions. We saw this play out two weeks ago in the telling of Adam and Eve, right? Right? God comes up to Adam and Eve and he says, first, where are you? And second, what have you done? And they blame God and then each other. We see this again last week with Cain and Abel. We find out that the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, right? That the children don't fall far from the parents. And Cain does the exact same thing when confronted by God. Where is your brother Abel? I wonder, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. They resort to blaming in a moment that they are confronted in their wrongdoing, which has us then ponder what is our default mode when we are confronted in the devastation that we cause in the lives of other people or maybe ourselves or the ways that we have not been faithful, faithful before God. Is blame the route that we go to, like some of these first humans? You see, because coming clean is not at all easy and it's not at all what we prefer. That moment between Jack and John, it, it pushes Jack into a new direction of thinking. When John asks one phrase, what if everything that happened here on the island, John says, what if everything that happened happened for a reason? Just one comment, one comment by John that, that pushes Jack to think a little bit bigger. To start thinking that maybe there is an underlying reason for, for not only him but the other survivors to be on that island. Maybe it's a, it's a purpose that he hasn't himself considered before or simply forgotten because of the trauma of the plane crash itself. But that's the same thing for us as well, right? That all it takes is, is one phrase, one comment by somebody else to cause us to think bigger. And maybe for you it was in a moment of, of trial of your life or heartbreak or devastation and you heard from somebody that you loved simply say, hey, whatever happens, know that I love you. Causes us to think bigger. 
Or maybe there's a moment of ruin in our lives that we've brought upon ourselves or somebody else has brought upon us or, or something that is just playing out around us when our footing starts to crumble and somebody comes up to us who we love and who loves us and say, hey, just want to let you know that whatever happens, I'm here with you and I'm not going anywhere. Causes us to think bigger. And that plays out in Genesis chapter 6 and it's, and it's quick. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's all it says. And then verse 9 comes on very quickly and it says, And Noah was one who walked with the Lord. That is, Noah was one who took in whatever God spoke out. Whether he agreed with it or not, he knew it was from the Lord and so he took it to heart. That Noah was one who walked wherever God went, even though everybody else went another direction. That's the characteristic of who Noah was. Genesis begins to explain. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I can imagine Noah hung on to that favor, especially when he started building the ark, which was by no means an overnight project. I'm not a pro at ark building, but I can imagine an ark 750 feet long takes a while when it's just you and your family, right? Family projects themselves take a while, no matter what they are. And then also into the days when the waters begin to recede and, and Noah starts to look around and sees life begin to emerge from dry ground. That Noah hung on, that somehow, some way, he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 6, devastation is directed toward God's creation. And yet we hear in the, in the very same scriptures, we hear in the very same story that the devastation of creation is ultimately directed upon God's own son, Jesus Christ. And it doesn't happen on a wooden ark. It happens on a wooden cross. The one who never balked or turned around from a question, why are you out here, Jesus? Even though it was asked with cynicism and anger. And at some points it was asked with intrigue and maybe some sort of inquisitiveness of trying to figure out who he was. It was Jesus who never turned away or turned a blind eye from the people that asked that question. But he clung on to the words of God in his baptism whenever he emerged from the waters and God said, this is my beloved son and in him I am well pleased. Those words that no doubt Jesus hung on to as he and his father were so profoundly interconnected with one another in moments when he went into situations and, and people wanted to have nothing to do with him even though he came there solely to give them love and care. It's Jesus who continued to walk the way of faithfulness, even one that would lead to the cross and die there. It was Jesus who, who, who hung out with the cultural renegades at the time and sat with the people that, that he shouldn't have sat with and, and been with at that time of, the, of, of culture. It was Jesus who confronted every single person that he saw. And some people received what he said, but truth be told, other people didn't. But it's also Jesus who confronts us, me and you. The one upon whom our sins are laid. The one who took nails into his hands and into his feet, a spear into his side, a crown of thorns onto his head for us. He confronts us. But here's the thing in a twist. Jesus doesn't demand a perfect answer to his question. Why are you out here and standing before me, talking to us? No, in this confrontation, things go a little bit differently. And it's Jesus who gives us a glimpse into what that confrontation will be like in Luke chapter 15. It's a story that as I begin to, to say it, you might recall. A father and a son are together, and the son, he approaches his father, and he basically wishes his father were dead by demanding his inheritance. And an inheritance is usually given whenever somebody passes away. And he says, I want my money now. And the father gives him his money, probably not too pleased about it. But, but the son takes all this money and he goes out to wherever he goes into the world. He gets, uh, gets away from his family, gets away from his house, gets away from his own city, his own town. And he starts to spend money and spend money. And he accumulates relationships that way. He's got an entourage, basically of people who are, who are loving him, not for himself, but for the money that he's offering and for the reputation that he's building, for the aura that he has around him. But as you know, and oftentimes in our society today, as the money fades, so do the friendships, right? As the status fades, so do the people that want to have their hand in that status. That's exactly what happens. He squanders everything he's got, tarnishes his name, tarnishes his reputation, has nothing in his pockets, nothing to his name at all. And he finds himself working in a, in a pig slop by giving food to pigs. Not exactly a glamorous job. 
And there's this moment that this son, he comes to his senses and he realizes, I am in a place of sheer depravity. That nobody wants the job that I have. When I leave this job, if I ever leave this job, there is not a list of people waiting to fill it. He's got nobody. He's got nothing. He's lost. But he comes to his senses one day and humility crosses over him. It passes over him. It clothes him. And he says, hey, maybe I'll go back home and take my chances. I'll go back home because at least there I know my father, my brother, my family is there. And so that's what he does. But it's interesting because on the way, which is not uncommon for us to do as well, on the way when we've been in a moment of guilt, we try to come up with some sort of response for why we did what we did, right? We try to expect the questions that other people are going to ask us and, and figure out answers that, that are good enough to appease other people. And so that's what he does. And he's rehearsing this, this answer over and over and over. He's trying to come up with an apology. But as he's looking down at his feet, walking in his guilt back home, he looks up and he doesn't even have a chance to talk because he sees his father running toward him. And dignitaries don't do that at the day. Dignitaries don't run. They send servants out to see the people and meet the people who are coming near. But he sees his father running toward him. And when his father comes up toward him, he embraces his son fully like a father does to his son whom he loves. And I can imagine it's one of those hugs that lasts just a little too long, right? Where the son kind of lets go, but the father's still hanging on. And so the son hangs on a little bit more. One of those hugs, you know, when you don't quite know they're going to end, but they're good hugs. And then the father grabs the son by the shoulders and thrusts him out and stares at him in the eyes with gladness. And he says this, for this my son was dead, but he's alive again. For this my son was lost, but now he is found. And a celebration ensues because the son comes back to the father. Not because of what the son has done, but because of who the son is in the eyes of his father. That's the way the confrontation looks with Jesus in us. You have been embraced by Jesus. Don't forget that. Jesus chose to embrace and call you his child. Don't forget that. Jesus sacrificed his very life for you. Don't forget that. And use that as a way to think bigger in this world. No matter what joys or trials we experience, that we are called his own. But even more than that, Jesus sends us back out into this world to engage this world the same way he engages us. To confront this world the same way he confronts us with care and compassion and joy and love the very best way that we can. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect at it, just faithful, because we're called to be faithful. Because at one time, truth be told, we were lost. But thanks be to God, we can now consider ourselves found through the love that Jesus has for you and me. In his name, amen.